Hi, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with AR, and I'd like to say hello to all of our friends in Kentucky. Now, just to start off, you ought to know from the beginning that Kentucky is a state looking at particularly high levels of change. You'd think that would mean the state would be getting some attention, some help for people to get ready, but the federal resources I use, they mentioned California almost 500 times, and Kentucky got a grand total of three citations. So we're gonna pull some things together here ourselves, figure out more about the challenges and opportunities this high level of predicted change indicates. The first thing we're gonna do is look at the USDA's predictions. Let's look at the heat map first, kind of rip the Band-Aid off, look at the summer heat up that's coming. Right now, Kentucky is a fairly cool state for the southeastern region with a, some of the state has sort of this minty color indicating a maximum of two months of uh, over 86 in the summer. Down in the corner here by this western spur of Appalachia, you might only see a couple of weeks over 86. And then as we get towards the Mississippi River, this yellow area sees maybe three months of summer and then maybe four months over 86 here. Let's go over and look at the projections for mid-century under RCP 4.5. And we see a tremendously large change there. We see many places are gonna look at two or even more than two months of increased heat. In the Appalachian foothills here, it's almost three. So if we look at the key again, we can see that much of the state now is gonna be looking at up to 150 days over 86 or 120 days over 86. And that unfortunately, the cool of the mountains here in this Western Spur is not as well preserved as other parts of Appalachia. So that's very serious. But before we make a lot of inferences from this level of summer heat up, let's take a second and look at the winter lows through the lens of plant hardiness zones. This is also a USDA tool that you can check out yourself to drill down into right exactly where you live. Right now, this is uh, based on historical data from the 80s to 2009. We can see that Kentucky sits in a mixed area between zone six and zone seven, partly depending on elevation, right? And if we look at the change for mid-century under RCP 4.5, which you can check out my video to understand more about what that means and why I think that's important for our future, you'll be able to see that we have a pretty clear transition across the state to zone seven. And that, is uh, in some ways a positive piece of information here, some good news. Because you can see that all of your neighbors to the north in Ohio, Indiana, Charleston, they are dealing with a marginal transformation where it's a little hard to see where zone seven is gonna end, zone six is gonna begin. The same thing down here in Tennessee where you start to see the zone eight incursion down at, towards the southern edge of the state. Kentucky, you have a pretty high level of assurance that you're going to be in a pure zone seven. Gives you some good ideas for what kind of plants to put in as you're looking at trees and other larger plants that will mature in 20 to 30 years. Zone seven tolerance will be a very safe bet for your state. And it's important to think about that. What sort of plants will mature that are very heat tolerant and want to deal with the zone seven winter because if we put together what we've learned from both of those maps, anywhere you're looking at more than a month of increased heat and also experiencing an increase in the plant hardiness zone, you're looking at areas where plant communities are likely to change dramatically. The federal reports refer to landscape transformation in the Southeast. That's exactly what these maps indicate will happen in Kentucky. But when we think about landscape transformation in this state, how the landscape could change we come across another challenge. If you check out my Georgia video, I'm able to show how the changes really line up with part of the Florida panhandle. So you'll be able to get a good idea if you visited there, what sorts of plant communities you could expect might transition into your area. However, for Kentucky, there is not a great match for what this projected climate would feel like that you could visit today. It'll be similar in the summer to Northern Mississippi and Northern Alabama, but the winter will be colder. So we're talking about a transition into a more extreme environment, not an environment for which we have great models. We can't just look at plant communities further south and necessarily think they'll be able to thrive in what Kentucky will become because of the winter freeze. 
but let's get some more information. Let's work on putting this together, get some more pieces of the puzzle turned right side up before we put it together. We're gonna to talk about water and weather and fire. So first thing we're gonna look at is precipitation trends for Kentucky. Well, you know, we can't tell the weather three months out, right? So it shouldn't shock you that we're not gonna be able to tell the weather three decades out. What we can do is look at precipitation trends and we do anticipate that these trends will continue. So as we look at Kentucky's trends for changes in heavy precipitation from the 50s to 2016, we see a lot of dots. What are we gonna say that those mean? If we look at the dark blue, that means we've had big drops in heavy precipitation. If we look at the dark red, big increases. So what I like to look at for areas that are good to dig in are large amounts of these pale dots. And we do see some good conservation, some relatively mild trends around Bowling Green. And this was also an area that saw a relatively milder for the state degree of heat up. So this is gonna be a pretty good area to dig in, it looks like. Over here, as we get towards the eastern edge of the state that was dealing with those very serious heat trends, both in the summer and the winter, we see more dark red and dark blue dots indicating a drought and deluge water pattern, indicating a much more challenging outlook, unfortunately, for this part of the state. And I know a lot of people there already have it rough, so it's, it's sad to have to deliver this news. So, Thinking about the weather a little bit more, there isn't a lot of scholarly work on this for some reason. I, I think there's not enough of a data set for people to feel mathematically confident. But you and I both know when you have a big transition from a cold winter to a hot summer, that means big storms in the fall and the spring, right? I would say that this information indicates a high probability that you'll see more damage from tornadoes and straight line winds across Kentucky, that the any trend that you've had towards tornadoes will intensify. And a big part of preparing in this state will be increased preparedness for wind storms. But let's get some good news in here. This forecast is pretty grim. On the good news front, Kentucky, one of the strongest cards in your hand is your surface water. When we're talking about a big heat up like we are for your state, we always wanna know the water outlook. Plants and living things are, of course, going to need more water in the heat. Kentucky has a lot of pride in its water. The publicly available water monitoring information is, simply put, the best I have seen in the entire country. I'm going to show you this website. It's from the Kentucky Geological Survey, and it is very hardcore. You can get information on the groundwater, well water, and uh, springs. You can look at quality data on every well in the state, getting you information on um, radionucleotides, pesticides, herbicides, it's incredible. So not only is there ample water in the state, it's very well taken care of, it's very well monitored. So if you're planning on digging in, you can get a great picture of your water outlook, the availability of water for irrigation, and its quality. This you know, if you're in Kentucky, it's probably not a shocker to you, right, that you've got great water quality. But as we think about the changes that are coming, it's crucial to think about water quality in light of water scarcity. In other water-rich parts of the southeast, there's substantially more water pollution than in Kentucky. And if you think about the national picture, you're looking at incredible water scarcity in the west making your state, even with these big changes, desirable. Particularly, there might be some desirable territory in that area with milder change around Bowling Green. Let's take a step back. So we've got this water richness. We've got some probably pretty chaotic weather trends in much of the state. And you know, unfortunately, we have that indication of landscape transformation from the size of the heat up. That, to me indicates that not only are you gonna have this unusually strong positive water card, you're gonna have an unusually strong negative fire card. When you have that level of stress on plant communities, say in unfortunately the Daniel Boone National Forest, you can expect to have mass tree die off. We've seen that happen in the West already. Unfortunately, wildfires will be coming to the East, but we've learned from what's happened in the West. 
There's a lot that can be done to manage wildfire near towns and homes, both through controlled burns and landscaping choices. The wildfire danger signs are extreme enough in Kentucky, I'd place it near the top of the list as you weigh the risks and strengths of this area. It is unique though, that we have this much risk of wildfire with this much abundance of water, speaking to the potential of this state to engage in unique landscape management choices. Whatever you can get to grow here, you're gonna be able to get it to grow verdantly and create landscapes that will avoid many of these challenges. I'm not saying that's a small job. We're talking about gardening on a truly grand scale, you know, and land management on the scale of national forests involved land management, but there is potential there. And if we can't imagine a good future, we can't make it, right? That water richness, it does allow us to imagine a good future for Kentucky. But there's a little more information I wanna get you as you put this picture together for yourself. This is a pretty complex outlook. We gotta look at the nighttime temperature projections. One of the big challenges the southeastern region is facing as a whole is an increase in warm nights, this nighttime warming. We all know many parts of the south are hot during the summer. No big surprise there. But most parts of the south, you could expect it would cool off really well at night, that it would go below 75 degrees at night. And I'm going to show you that historical data. Here we go. We're going back to the federal report. So this is um, from the 70s to 2005, historical number of warm nights. You can see that expe except for on the coast and around the Gulf, you would pretty much not have nights over 75 in much of the South and, and never in Kentucky. But we're gonna scroll down to the next page here. We're gonna look at the 4.5 scenario and see how many warm nights we expect by mid-century. We've lost a lot of the daytime cooling effect from the mountains over on the eastern side. But fortunately, we do see continuation of the nighttime cooling effects. We see relatively mild nighttime cooling here in this central area where we see hopefully milder trends relative to the rest of the state of the heat up and of precipitation. We're looking at, it looks like um, maybe two weeks of warmer nights there. And then as we get closer to the river, you move into uh, maybe a month, month and a half of nights over 75 degrees. So if we put that together, the increase in nighttime warming and the increase in daytime warming, that should be a real alarm bell that it's time to strengthen the power grid, right? Because there are gonna be increased energy demands. I hope you looked a little bit at the maps for the rest of the region though, and you can see that that's not as severe an increase in energy demands as you're gonna have in much of the rest of the region. Also, that conservation of the nighttime cool in Eastern Kentucky will be important for agriculture. You're gonna get less of a yield drop of your uh, staple crops in Kentucky than you might in much of the rest of the region where you know the hot days, they happen, but a lot of the plants do their growing at night. Soy fills its pods at night. It can't do it if it gets too hot. So that's a, that's a positive card for Kentucky, the relative lack of nighttime warming for the region. Okay, we're getting a lot closer to being able to put this puzzle together. Kentucky, let me be straight with you. It's an extremely challenging outlook. The state is likely to be looking at elevated severe weather risks, probably very destructive storms in the spring and the fall to accommodate that unusually large hot cold transition. The same unusually large temperature transition, it's likely to lead to complete landscape turnover. You're gonna experience a lot of ecosystem changes, a lot of loss of landscapes that are familiar and beloved. You may see the forests die and that could bring the danger of wildfire to your state. Between the daytime and nighttime warming projections, you are looking also at a serious increase in demand on your power grid. So getting some power independence, energy independence is gonna be a good move for people who wanna dig in. But there are positives. Your heat up, it's not gonna push against human survival limits as much as it will further south. The Eastern half of the state, the half that's retaining its cool nights, you've got some unusually good agricultural potential for the Southeast. You could maintain more staple crop productivity there. 
than in many of your southern neighboring states. If there's a biggest strength for the state, it's the water outlook. However the landscape is gonna transform, it'll be able to do so verdantly. Let me say again, we don't know how the landscapes will transform. So Kentucky is gonna need vision, imagination, the strength to have a guiding hand and use your rich water resources to grow new landscapes. You're gonna need really active land management here to bring your state into its best possible future. It'll take both experimentation and determination to learn what kind of a garden can be created in this state under these projected conditions. There are many living things that are gonna be moving north from Northern Alabama and Northern Mississippi that'll wanna find a home. And that home could be in the Kentucky of the future. The landscapes into which the familiar countryside in Kentucky will transform. Right now, we can't say what they'll be, but there's tremendous potential here that will be defined by the actions of those brave enough to dig in here in this challenging landscape. There are opportunities for self-determination here, landscape level self-determination that I have not seen anywhere else because of the unique richness and quality of your water resources. This is Dr. Sherning with AR signing out. You know, please like and subscribe, help get the message out there. There is hope. We can prepare for what's coming. The more we know, the more we can plan. Let's get ready.